open up the discussion with something that will seem completely unrelated to road tunnels. The uh, highly regarded uh, lead economist from the World Bank, uh, Branko Milanovic, developed a curve that for obvious reasons became known as the orphan curve. And his work was involved in this, that <clears throat> across the bottom of the slide in 10% groups are uh, earning groups. This was done in, uh, on European and American data. Bottom 10%, middle 10%, middle top 10%. And that data he found up until the time of the global financial crisis saw a, a heartening increase in earning or wealth among the bottom groups in society, a rather significant depression from what you might call the middle class or lower middle class, and a predictable increase at the big end of town. A 2016 version saw that more flattened out with essentially, and here we've got an expansion on our top 10%, so the, the scale's a little bit distorted. But the message is pretty clear that the shift in wealth in the international community increasingly, as I guess it always has done, favours those at the top end. People have done some work on this in Australia, and in fact, that entire curve is very flat not far above zero in the 10% range until you reach the top 5% where it shoots upwards. And you might say, that's interesting, but what does it have to do with road tunnels? And I think what it has to do with it very much is the question of keeping your eye on the dollars, which is always a good idea. And the funding for these road tunnels came from the sale of public assets. So they're assets that we were all a part of. The sale of the assets, which are predominantly um, the uh, power assets, the famous electricity privatisation, has come with no brilliant result in terms of electricity costs or performance. It's certainly seen huge increases in the earnings of the senior executives of the now privatised companies. It's seen a transfer of funds into public infrastructure, supposedly, via a circuitous route and a rather secretive route that seems to me to have elements about it that take what was a bit stodgy but a productive public asset, slides it through a bit of smokes and mirrors and secretive outfits like the uh, Sydney Motorways Corporation and seems to have a very big risk that the primary benefit of that transfer is a private company and those associated with it. So the original owners of the asset, you and me and those around us, go from holding a position of having equity in our power assets, which was returned to our state budget with a reasonable income, could have been improved, but reasonable. We now pay more for power, we don't have that asset, we don't have that return to the budget, and it looks highly likely that we'll pay through the nose to use the roads that have been built with our money where the profit goes to someone else. And it seems to me in that process, there's a risk of being diddled. And I, I think in looking at every aspect of this, because I know there are submissions being developed for a uh, parliamentary process, we should never lose sight of the money. And that includes the air quality aspect, which I'll now move to. Very quickly, we all know we've got a network of road tunnels in New South Wales, and in Sydney rather, and this is not an anti-infrastructure or anti-tunnel or anti-road bash. We've got a big city, I think it's highly questionable how big we can afford to let it get in social terms but we need to service that community and road transport is part of it. I think the emphasis on it is too great personally, but it's very important. So we have this network of tunnels and we're now adding to them. And so far, and it's important to note, and I'll come to a bit more detail, we've had relatively short tunnels and by and large tunnels that haven't been overly utilised, the busiest one, where air quality problems really emerged and remain was the M5 East on the area of that tunnel heading out of town the last two kilometres, where air quality became pretty appalling. Um, the other tunnels have so far not given difficulty, but as I'll come to in a moment, we're now moving into a whole new world of tunnels that are eight to 10 kilometres long, questionably ventilated, no air treatment provided for, and will be heavily trafficked. That's a new ball game. Quickly, that is a, a, a slide.
like you'd be familiar with, that shows the proposed extensions, the West Connects, and the ventilation stacks and tunnel infrastructure proposed for this area. Quickly again, some points on our existing road tunnels that lead me into Matal. We've got a, a short and efficient tunnel under the harbour that was built with a form of ventilation called transverse ventilation, which washes air across the traffic and progressively cleans the air with the objective of keeping air quality in the tunnel consistent all the way along. Uh, it's variously said that that transverse option is not used, but it's a short tunnel um, in two separate tubes. The Eastern Distributor, M5 East Lane, Cove and Cross City tunnels are all tunnels between two kilometres and four kilometres long. In the case of the M5 East, while it's said to be four kilometres long, it's really in two horseshoe halves as far as ventilation. So, so the, the longest ventilation leads in these is the uh, three odd kilometres of the Lane Cove Tunnel. They're longitudinally ventilated, and I'll come to that in a moment because it's an important part of the tour. The one long tunnel that we're getting close to introducing is the North Connect. And I mention it here because I've been able to do quite a lot of uh, work on it. I did get some good data. Uh, and it's a tunnel that's 9.2 kilometres long, so a long tunnel. It's similar in its uh, design to the tunnels that you'll be seeing in your area. The idea of ventilation is you push the traffic and the people in the air in one end and it progressively gets a little dirtier. It's called longitudinal ventilation. The cars help push the air along. You push it out at the end and certainly uh, my modelling on that showed that when you got past halfway in that tunnel, past the five kilometre, six kilometre mark, just the physical effects of drag and the accumulated effect of particle accumulation and general air pollutant accumulation meant that by the time you got to the last quarter of that tunnel, you were in air that very significantly exceeded any measure of, of standards of air quality. That, of course, then transfers to a single stack where that air has to be disposed of, and there's some considerable concern about that. But the important thing from the point of view of your tunnels, I think, or the tunnels in your area, they're not going to be ours anymore, is that long tunnels and heavy traffic, when simply ventilated by a push system, a piston system of pushing air through and having cars push the air through, or vehicles and trucks, does lead to an acceleration and accumulation of pollutants that exceeds world standards. And it's of some concern to me that the uh, response of the government where air quality problems have popped up in tunnels seems to have been to put up a sign wind up your windows and turn your air conditioning on to recirculate, which sort of suggests they don't want you to breathe that stuff. Now, that's not really a very satisfactory answer. And what I develop here is the idea there's concern about air when it comes out of stacks and those around it. We'll come to that and it's important. Also terribly important, in some ways more important, that the air in the stacks, in, in the tunnels themselves, if that air exceeds a reasonable quality, then not only those near the stacks are exposed, but everyone using the tunnel. Because you can't totally rely on that air not getting into cars. And if it does get into the cab of a vehicle, it rides with that vehicle long after the tunnel. And of course, we're heading for a whole lot of these tunnels. Traffic gets busier. The government relies on the fact that emissions decrease, and they do, but you've got a volume factor as well. And it seems to me that it should be uh, a requirement of this project separate from any argument about its commercial viability, and that's a very important consideration. We're not going to go there, Justin. In terms of air quality, if we're going to build them, they must be built properly. If we're going to ventilate them, they should be ventilated properly. And people at the end of the process should have air quality that's no worse than they started with. That's all the people and the people near the stacks. The air quality, these are the issues I've just mentioned, and the pollutants of concern are primarily carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, hydrocarbon residues, and the fine particulates that I know when you will talk about in a moment. Something I do point out in general, these very fine particulates, when they're sourced from internal combustion engines, which they will be in road tunnels, have a great capacity to have absorbed onto their surface the hydrocarbon residues and the, some of the complex nitrogen oxides, which make them a rather nasty little matrix to go into your system. And uh, Dr Ray Nasser, who Dave referred to, done quite a lot of work looking at these aggregated 
polluting particles, and the results aren't good. You're better off not breathing. And in fact, you're distinctly disadvantaged for, in, in health terms by doing so. My sad understanding of what's going on at the moment is that the government, and I can't understand why, is it seems to me the concerns I'm expressing are concerns they should have. We must do this properly. We've got a responsibility to the community. They don't seem to express it or give any voice to it. And we must be sure that we have a complete control over air quality in these things. Talk a little more now about those ventilation options and something about air cleaning options. The two main ways that tunnels are ventilated are longitudinal and transverse. Longitudinal, I've mentioned, you push the cars in one end, you put the people in, the, in that end, you push the whole lot through. It's a bit like swimming in the sewer pipe. It gets a bit murkier as you get along, then you come out the other end. It works in short tunnels and it works if you don't have too many cars. It's not great, but it works. It's cheap because for obvious reasons you don't have to build side tunnels to take air. Transverse ventilation, which countries like Japan in their current Tokyo tunnel exercise, and Japan's not a country that's run by you know, raging Trotskyists. It's a very conservative country. In their tunnel, they, their tunnels under Tokyo, which are a massive exercise in their current, notwithstanding what the state government's saying, they use transverse ventilation. In other words, there's a separate to the road tunnel, a tube or a tunnel that contains fresh air, and a tube or a tunnel separately contains the contaminated air. Fresh air is progressively fed into the tunnel and contaminated air is washed out so that the air quality in the tunnel at least maintains a standard right through. So that at least you can be sure that the air within the tunnel is okay. You still face the problem when you discharge it that you've got to give some consideration to how you do that. It's not a knock on longitudinal ventilation, but longitudinal ventilation very much favoured by civil engineering companies because most of these contracts to build tunnels although they're written in different language devolve down to fixed cost contracts so you, if you finally finish up with a very big dollar number to build a tunnel and the less cost you have in doing it the more profit you retain so I, I have in the past done some work on ventilation systems and so on for a previous government and during the conduct of that work, I had countless times senior people from civil companies saying, well, you will find this, of course, don't, don't, don't mention the fact that we've got to have more expensive ventilation or that air treatment might work, because that elephant, that dollar drive, favours that method. It's a fine method as long as the tunnel's not too long and there aren't too many people, but it fails at a point in time. There's a semi-transverse hybrid that washes air in and takes it out in one tube, but it's really uh, semantics. So I think the problems we face as a community, first of all, the tunnel ventilation, it seems to me in this whole presentation by the government on these tunnels, there's very little detail. There's an assumption that longitudinal ventilation will work just fine, and being an old bugger, if some of you can probably think back as I can to a former gentleman, I guess the word lightly, who was a Premier of Queensland, Joe Bjorki Peterson, who, who responded to tricky questions by saying, don't you worry about that. Now, don't you worry about that. And the government's response when you ask a question, well, have you had a good look at how you're going to ventilate these? And don't you worry about that. I don't think they have. I think they're so well bent on getting it done and they've transferred so much of their authority, which we delegate to them, to the private sector, that it's the contractors determining how this will get done. And that may or may not be the right answer. Exhaust emissions are an issue. The government tends to say, look, the problem will go away. We'll get to the stage where we have electrically powered vehicles and there won't be any emissions. And we might, but we won't get to that stage until long after this tunnel's open. So the tunnel's got to be designed to cater to today's vehicles. And if emissions improve, and I hope they do, and they are improving, <coughs> That will be a benefit in the future, but you can't operate an unsafe tunnel waiting for the state of vehicle technology to change, in my view. Health impacts are real. Whether it's Ray NASA or whether it's others, whether it's expressed at a high level of concern or a moderate level of concern, depending on the language and the feelings, no sensible person says breaches of air quality don't straight away lead to premature deaths 
an increase in the rates of a whole range of illnesses, they're serious things. Air quality is something that we should treat with great caution. We're fortunate in Australia, but we should be. We're a very lucky country. Our air quality is pretty good. We should keep it that way. I think there's a little bit of an argument de facto behind the government's releases that says, well, we've got a bit of spare capacity. What's it matter? A little bit here, a little bit there. This stuff is harmful to health. The risks increase with concentration in long tunnels. The concentration goes up like that elephant curve at the end because all the physics of the thing say the drag effects just build the concentration and it gets quite nasty towards the end. In that modelling on the North Connects tunnel, I found you could get levels up to 100 times, readily, 100 times the recommended concentrations. That's very serious. I mean, you could argue if it goes over by 10%, well, there's a bit of spare capacity in the standard. But there's not 100%, not 100 fold capacity give away in the standard. Government agencies themselves have expressed concerns. The Department of Health expressed concerns, and the end result was that, first of all, a very small sign turn your uh, window, put your windows up and turn your air conditioning on to recycling, and then slightly bigger signs. Um, it seems to me a bit of a throwaway response because the difficulty with these tunnels, if you build them the wrong way in the first place, retrofitting any sort of correction is virtually impossible or as expensive as the first cost of the tunnel. So it's really very sensible from a government's point of view to get this right. And I think not dealing with it reflects a sort of contempt for the public that is of concern. There are all of those problems um, encapsulated. It's around tunnel ventilation, Exhaust emissions at the stacks are important, health impacts are real, and particular, particular, see particular as I mentioned earlier, uh, in conjunction with other air contaminants, are carcinogenic. Um, these are very real and established facts, it's not fantasy. I think coming to the solutions, and they're important if you're thinking about putting in a, a uh, response. One of the first Solutions, I think, is that there are ways around the world of having the performance of air in tunnels accurately modelled. And we should be doing that. And that modelling process should have public access. We're not doing it. All of the work on the tunnels has been done by people who are bound to the government on the basis that they want the next job to. And you tend to get people to give the answer that's required. It's a, a fact of life. So the modelling's being done by, it's an adversarial process, it's being done in defence of the project. And like most things in science and technology, you can come up with a defence for either side. But I don't think the modelling and the other aspects of the process should be by way of defence of the project. They should be by way of interrogation or examination, they should be objective. And at arm's length and done by someone who's not going to do the next job for the government, doesn't need the next job for the government, and is prepared to give what was once referred to as Frank and Fiora's advice, not much of it around. Best practice tunnel ventilation is terribly important because if, it, if you determine through an objective process that pushing all the cars in one end and all the people and all the air doesn't work and you finish up building the tunnel that way, you can't fix it. You simply can't fix it. So if you find the air quality exceeds some reasonable standard, do you turn the tunnel off? I mean, it's crazy because it's too big a gamble. And of course, the government won't put up a red flag in front of the tunnel. I'll just whitewash the exercise. Oh, it's not really that bad. Wind your windows up a bit tighter. Better to get it right first. It's not hard to get the right design. And if it costs more, that ought to be taken into account. Coming back to our friend the elephant, it was our money. I don't think anyone wants a tunnel that's not safe. The separate arguments about how many we should have and where they should go. But Whatever you do, make them safe, make them good. I, I just want to mention briefly the question of the stacks because the same principle is now being taken to stacks without much justification, that there will be no requirement for air treatment, that the stacks will disperse these contaminants. As I've just explained, it's a double whammy because if you go into longitudinal ventilation and right up the end where you're taking the air out of the tunnel is the worst quality. You, you get this concentration of pollution that's what goes up the stack, so you can magnify the problem. And if you play pencil and rubber games, which governments are good at, with the air quality in the tunnel, then you're underlating the design you need for your stack. 
You're saying, oh, it won't be too bad. But if, if you get bad results at the end of the tunnel, you'll have bad results in the stack. Now you can deal with that because there are technologies available. You don't want to use them if you don't have to because they cost money. That can treat the air in the stack. But what we're seeing at the moment is the government saying, we have not much work on this and we're really relying on what the contractors are saying, but we don't need to ventilate the tunnel properly and it'll be okay or in the stack. <clears throat> it's a bit more of the Jack Jockey, but don't you worry about that, it'll all be okay. It's a funny approach to take because they're serious exercises. And if you get the air quality wrong near the stack, get the air quality wrong in the tunnel, there's a price to pay in public health. That brings with it the need to monitor and that's not being done properly. And I think primarily it brings with it the need within the stacks to at the very least provide the design provision for a clean up of the air if it's required. That's not even a terribly expensive thing to do and that's not being done. There's some of the solutions I've just mentioned. I think one of the really important ones is the bottom line. That there needs to be a much more honest approach and a much more respectful approach to the public which needs to bring with it a transparency that's not currently present in the process. It's your money and my money in a sense is being transferred from former assets that were reasonably productive to new assets, yet it seems to me to be proceeding by almost a secretive smokes and mirrors mechanism that doesn't reflect very well on the government at all. The questions I'm asking are the questions I think the government ought to be asking and I see no evidence that they are. As I said, the international experience runs contrary to what the government's saying. The government says no one really is using technology. Well, the Japanese are in Tokyo. They're doing a similar thing right under Tokyo, a massive exercise. Now, right now, not 100 years ago. And they're transverse ventilating their tunnel and they're putting the air out through treatment stacks every 1.1 kilometres to ensure that A, the tunnel air is good and with those more frequent emission stacks, even though the, the politics of it and the uh, optics of it aren't good for politicians, it ensures the air coming out of the stacks is OK. In Madrid, just as an example, of, this is the road tunnel down here, they're using a lot of mechanisms where through treatment of the air, the air can be discharged through a garden or through a landscaped area, not through a stack, completely clean and monitored. There's options too for in-tunnel air treatment. There are technological solutions, but they're hard to retrofit. What, what's available in tunnel air quality is that you can mount in the roof of the tunnel a progressive series of devices that can help maintain tunnel air quality. They're not being considered, but they're used overseas. I'm not sure that they're, that they're a bit of a, a patch when you get a longitudinal tunnel wrong. So I think summing it up, we need to take a much more balanced and integrated approach to transport. I've started this discussion on the basis that they're going to build tunnels. These are some of the air quality situations. As David said at the outset, I'm not at all convinced that the emphasis on road tunnels and roads is correct. In fact, looking at a Sydney where I've done some fair amount of work that, that's heading towards an uncapped population, I think it runs the risk of becoming a very difficult city to manage in social terms. Uh, people talk about seven or eight million, but uh, our population will grow beyond that unless other settings are put in place. My own view is that we need transport infrastructure that stimulates regional development and perhaps finally breaks the nexus where every, or 90% of every new member of the society has to live in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. High speed rail can help that, and I do think, although it's it's related, but not directly related. It was a rather sad thing when we inked in a second airport to ink in doubling of the city's size without regard to high-speed rail. It might have served Western Sydney and, and the whole of the city and the whole of the community better. I think the public needs to be treated as a stakeholder in this. I certainly don't feel like I'm being treated like a stakeholder. I'm sure you don't. But I think we are. The money came from an asset that we held. Uh, Air quality must be safeguarded. Stacks and filtration, stack location, air quality monitoring, all very important. We need to have best practice tunnel ventilation, just not the lowest cost one that leads to the best profit for the builder. And I think the proposed ventilation method that we're looking at on these long tunnels is a real concern. Ventilation and air quality are linked, as I've said. 
And the minimum cost, maximum profit model is a pretty risky model. Thank you very much.